the synthesis of ketones and aldehydes. It's going to be a brief lesson before we get to all the reactions of ketones and aldehydes. And uh, what's making this so brief is that every single synthesis for ketones and aldehydes here is going to be review. We're going to review the synthesis of ketones and aldehydes by the oxidation of primary and secondary alcohols, the ozonolysis of alkenes, the hydration of alkynes, and then a couple of the reactions we learned in the last chapter, Friedel-Crafts acylations and the gatterman coke synthesis for making benzaldehydes. Now this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so let's do a little review here. So we'll start with the oxidation of alcohols. And uh, for primary alcohols, you learned that there are two hydrogens on the carbon with the hydroxyl group. And as a result, primary alcohols can be reduced, I'm sorry, oxidized either one or two steps. And we learned that if you want to oxidize with just a single step, you're going to use PCC and that will oxidize it to an aldehyde. So had we used chromic acid, we would have oxidized it two steps all the way to a carboxylic acid, which obviously is not the relevant functional group for this chapter. Uh, but for secondary alcohols, there's only one hydrogen on the carbon with the hydrox group, so it's only capable of one step of oxidation. And so it doesn't really matter if you use PCC or chromic acid. So when you had a multitude of ways to draw chromic acid, the most common of which is probably sodium or potassium dichromate with a strong acid like sulfuric acid. But either way, in this case, you oxidize it one step to a ketone. So cool, just review ways we learned back in the alcohol chapter for turning a primary alcohol into an aldehyde or a secondary alcohol into a ketone. So the next reaction we'll look at, it was ozonolysis of alkenes. And you might recall that ozonolysis is an example of what we call oxidative cleavage, and it will cleave either a carbon-carbon double or triple bond. And we want to look at the carbon-carbon double bonds in this example. And, and on both sides, this is going to get replaced with a carbon-oxygen double bond instead. And so on the left-hand side, we'll have a carbon oxygen double bond, and that's a ketone. On the right-hand side, we'll have a carbon oxygen double bond, and it depends. So it turns out with ozonolysis, you learn that you can do it under either oxidizing or reducing conditions. And ketones are going to be a ketone no matter what. But if you form an aldehyde by the initial uh, oxidative cleavage step, either you can keep it an aldehyde or it could get further oxidized to a carboxylic acid, depending on what you use in step two. And if we did this under oxidizing conditions with H2O2, this would become a carboxylic acid. So, but if we use a reducing agent like either dimethyl sulfide, which might be written as just simply DMS with an abbreviation, or with uh, a metal like zinc and water, and I say like zinc, you're probably only gonna see it with zinc, uh, but either one of these would be an appropriate reducing agent and it will keep the aldehyde we have formed here an aldehyde. And, and this is the one time we often draw a hydrogen bonded carbons when it's part of an aldehyde. So don't think I added this hydrogen in. It was there the whole time. That hydrogen is right there, not drawn in. But often when we, again, form an aldehyde, that's the one time we'll draw a hydrogen bonded to a carbon. Cool. And so here's another way to form both ketones and aldehydes, depending on what alkene you would have started with. So next reaction to review here for forming ketones and aldehydes is the hydration of alkynes. And uh, we have two major for this, we had acid catalyzed hydration. And for a terminal alkyne, the reagent's a little bit different than for an internal alkyne. So it turns out the terminal alkyne, you need mercury 2 plus as a catalyst. For the internal alkyne, you don't need the mercury. You can use it, you just don't need it. So, but then you also have hydroboration oxidation for the alkyne, in which case we often use what's called a bulky borane. And here I'm using the most common example of a bulky borane, dicyamyl borane. But you could see just, uh, you know, two R groups drawn here or two cyclohexyl groups or something like this. A couple different options for a bulky borane, but this is by far the most common dicyamyl borane uh, abbreviated here. And they're just two big bulky carbon chains. Uh, and in this case, if we do this with a terminal alkyne, we can talk about Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov. And uh, for the acid catalyzed hydration, it goes Markovnikov, and you initially form an enol, but that tautomerizes to the ketone. And so if you look at your two carbons, it's the internal one, not the terminal one. So the more substituted one that's going to end up with the oxygen, and instead of being an enol, an alcohol at that carbon, it's going to tautomerize to a ketone at that carbon instead. Now, if you use that terminal alkyne with uh, hydroboration oxidation, this goes anti-Markovnikov, and now it'll be the terminal carbon, the less substituted carbon, that gets the double bond to oxygen instead. And so in this case, we'll form an aldehyde. And so uh, for a, a terminal alkyne, we can form either the ketone or the aldehyde, depending on which of our uh, hydration reagents we use. 
Then with an internal alkyne, it doesn't matter if one side's got a longer chain than the other, but for an internal alkyne, it's equally substituted on both sides. So this, you know, if we didn't have a triple bond here, this sp carbon would be analogous to being secondary, and so would this one, and they'd be equally substituted. And so there's really no Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov to talk about here. So the big thing I want to show, though, is that, again, with an internal alkyne, so instead of HgSO4, H2SO4, you can just use, you know, aqueous H2SO4 here. So sometimes we'll see the water included on these. Either way, it's aqueous H2SO4. And in this case, uh, we don't need the mercury. You can throw it on there and it goes faster, but you don't need it for the internal alkyne. So, but also it doesn't matter which of our reagents we use, whether you use the normal Markovnikov reagent here or the anti-Markovnikov reagent here with hydrobration oxidation, it does not matter. Your carbonyl can end up on this carbon or this one, giving you two different regioisomers. And it doesn't matter which case you do. These are gonna lead to the same product here. And so in this case, we're gonna end up with a one, two, three, four, five carbon chain. So, and we're gonna end up with a carbonyl on carbon two, or we're gonna end it with carbon three as well. And again, it doesn't matter which set of reagents we use for that internal alkyne, we'll get a couple of different ketones either way. And one thing to remember, if you use a symmetrical ketone, like I didn't use here, this one's asymmetrical, the left side and the right side are different. With an asymmetrical, we get the two different ketones. Had this been symmetrical though, you would have formed just two equivalents of the exact same ketone. So the last pair of reactions we wanna take a look at here for synthesizing ketones and aldehydes are first the Friedel Crafts acylation, and we'll use an acyl halide with our Lewis acid catalyst here, aluminum chloride, and in this case, uh, the aluminum chloride is going to pull off the chlorine, forming the acylium cation, which we'll then attack and do EAS with. But end result here. So, and that R group is any kind of variable carbon chain, different length, substituted, however, whatever we want. And so we'll form a ketone here, and it helps if I remember to get my pi electrons in there. So, but then we learned that if you just want to add a single carbon acylation, so it turns out that the acyl halide that you'd need for just a single carbon uh, is so reactive you can't have it. You got to actually make it by mixing carbon monoxide and HCl, we say in C2. So, but if you do so, you do the Gatterman Coke synthesis here, and you add just a single carbon and get a benzaldehyde instead. And so uh, from the last chapter, we've got a way to make either a, a ketone coming off a benzene ring or an aldehyde, a benzaldehyde from a benzene ring. That is the summary of all the review of all the reactions that we can use to make ketones and aldehydes. This should be helpful for retrosynthesis that we'll take up at the end of this chapter. If you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, or the whole chapter of lessons, if you are looking for practice problems on ketones and aldehydes, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.